God. So okay. Happy. So okay. Is he not connected? So he recorded the, the lecture. So we're gonna play it, and then uh, maybe if he can connect with us, he's gonna be at the end or any time. But for now, let's just start enjoying the material that he has. That you're gonna be blown away with the material that he always put together. He has so much talent and has beautiful taste for education. Really beautiful. So um, let's go. Let's go for it. Beautiful. Andre. Thank you. This was a little bit complicated. We will spend a little time on it. Not, I will not go into the details with this case because this is two hours speaking. You can also have a look at this case on Lucas Lassman, the dentist profile and it's about 170 slides so you can have it in details and I call it Monday morning patient because very often when you finish the course the first patient on Monday morning that has everything that you've just learned on the course. I believe this patient will not come on a Monday morning, especially in the coronavirus time. But I'll tell you, when I see people with such a teeth, I'm honestly excited. I'm honestly excited because I feel, I feel that it ends with a very good result. I already see it with my imagination that we end with a beautiful smile, patient is crying, we are hugging together and we are so happy with the result. But sometimes it turns out that we want to do the good job, but the result is totally opposite to our assumption. And then we got very sad because we didn't plan it properly. So you must plan your treatment properly from the beginning. Otherwise, you may expect very bad results. So what do we start is I always do the COIS questionnaire. And with the COIS questionnaire, it turned out that this patient has a dysfunction. So he has a problem to find his bite. I ask him the patient which bite, uh, I'm asking the patient to close and he's asking me which bite should I use, right? So this is, this is the case. He's probably he's struggling to find a bite. Of course, we always have to ask ourselves the question, why did it happen? Because if you don't know, don't know the reason, why did it happen, and you make the full mouth reconstruction, maybe you haven't solved the problem yet. So maybe this patient will destroy your full mouth reconstruction with the same pattern as he destroyed his teeth. We will not talk about the, the reason for this destruction now because there is no time for that. What we do with this examination, so I do the rock bottom map of pain, which is pretty precise examination of the joint. This is what we do on the hands-on because you always have to feel it, you have to touch it. You, can, you cannot just speak about it because you know what was the pressure, where is the condyle, was the movement of the condyle, where to put a, your finger. So this patient has a, a pain number one and pain number two, which is anterior inferior synovium and anterior superior synovium. But this, this is not a, a acute TMD. It only means that this patient is probably hypermobile. So this condyle is going into excessive translation. It's going too much forward with opening. So I'm not concerned about this TMD in here and it's not surprising because what I observe is most of my patients with severe teeth destruction and attrition, they do not have problem with the, uh, with the joints, with TMD. Because if, if, if they had problem with the TMD, they wouldn't use the muscles so significantly because it produces pain. So most of your patient with TMD is women at the age between 20 and 40. And now, from now on, you will have a lot of these people with TMD disorders because there is a lot of stress nowadays. And stress produces parafunction and parafunction with instability of the joint may cause TMD disorders. So these are precipitating factors and uh, this is why we spend so much time nowadays on the courses on TMD because you will have a lot of these patients. Unfortunately, I'm also clenching for the last two weeks. That's strange. I've never done that before. But the situation is very tough for us. So coming back to our Monday morning patient. 
if you want to start your treatment the same as you start your treatment with your wax and the full denture patient first you want to know where will you position the teeth on the face right so when you want to position the teeth on the face you have to take a pictures you have to take a pictures and also you have to take these two important pictures that I told you about so which is the rest position and the full smile so once you have these two pictures and the same position important is that you, when your patient is uh, smiling is, is resting like this he cannot move his head for the full smile so it cannot look like because then you will not overlap these two pictures all right so the head position must be stable or if you do not have these skills you can just use a composite as I showed you with the previous with the previous case so what I can do now is I can measure how much do I want to make this uh, upper incisor longer down to the the, the, uh, the upper lip border and if I want to this incisor to stick out two millimeters lower I know that I will make this incisor longer six millimeters six millimeters so you can do all these measurements of course these old measurements are pretty subjective because the beauty is very subjective uh, this, is, this is very subjective but sometimes you may have the lip that is too long for example so you cannot use this consideration like with this case that I do with Radoslav Yadach and in a couple of weeks I hope I'll show you the final result so what we did in here it was a lip lift first I, I heard about it from Kyle Stanley my friend from United States it was a lip factor so then when I saw this patient with such a long lip and with almost no red part of this lip visible I knew that this is the case so what we did was the lip lift also to create bigger exposure of the upper lip mm, uh, of the teeth and the upper teeth at rest so we'll get to this case probably soon so once you do all these lines the eye line the symmetry line and so on and so on I finally may get rid of the rest position I do not need it anymore I need a rest position for the soft tissues and also for the symmetry line but this is not the subject for now and when I finally have it <clears throat> I can even work on the intraoral picture and I can make all these measurements and I'll tell you uh, for, for me, digital smile design and all smile designs is the, the number and the lines, numbers and lines, not these shapes. I mostly do smile design for me to make the design to know where, I, where I'm going to put the incisal edge and when I want to make the zenits for the crown lengthening. Nowadays we are making the shapes of the teeth according to the face, which is good, according to the character, which is also good, like in uh, Visagism from Galip Gurel, mm, like introverted, extroverted. And I even heard about behavioral dentistry. So the dentist is taking his patient and dental technician for holiday and they're spending some time together and finally they can choose the proper shape of the central incisor for this patient. Where is the limit? What can we do with our patient to find the proper shape? And what you have to remember, what determines the shape of the teeth in nature also is the length of papilla so if you decide that you will make the triangular shape of the centrals for your patient but he's got periodontitis you can also give this patient black triangulars between the teeth and they will not like it they will not like it so think about papilla as well so after we do this digital smile design and we know the length of the incisor you look at this picture sorry you look at this picture and you know straight away that this patient probably needs uh, increasing vertical occlusal dimension if you know that you increase the length of the upper incisor six millimeters and let's say that you do not make your lower incisor longer but you want to get uh, one millimeter over bite how high will be your platform six minus one if you want to have six millimeters longer this upper incisor but you want to have an edge-to-edge -edge bite 
How high will be your platform? 6 millimeter. If you want to have a 6 millimeter longer, your upper incisor, but you want in without changing the length of the lower one, you want to have a 3 millimeters overbite. What will be the thickness, the height of your platform? 3 millimeters. So you can measure leaf gauge, you can measure Koi's the programmer with Lucidic and some other uh, equipment is not possible. This is why I do not use it. So now you see that when you, when the, the space between the frontal teeth is your, uh, is most important for you, then you can use DSD to determine final VOD. And I'll tell you, if you increase five millimeter in here, the, 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 um, the probability that you will not have enough space at the back is very low. So probably you'll have more than enough. So your main concern now is not the space at the back, but space in the front. DSD is good to do that. So we finally have five millimeters of the, the, the height of the platform. So when your patient is wearing down the teeth and the, the, the height of the face remains the same. This is called dental alveolar compensation. So it means that the teeth are wearing down, but there is a, uh, the, the bone is growing. And with these cases, when you increase VOD now, very often the face looks like a horse, it's going to be too long. So what can we do? You have to decide, because very often in here you have to do the crown lengthening. But how can we decide whether we're going to do the crown lengthening or increasing VOD? Easy. Take a picture at rest. So when you take a picture at rest, and let's say that this is a picture at rest, and now these teeth sticks out two millimeter below the upper lip at rest. You know that you do not want to make them even longer because you don't want a patient to look like a rabbit. So now I want to make them longer up, not down. On the other hand, if your patient is, has a rest position, oh, I'm not because I know, sorry for that. It looks like a whale, right, with the eye in here. So when your patient when your patient has this type of uh, rest position, I want to have this exposure of the upper teeth at rest two millimeters. So then I know that I will make it longer down, like with the Monday morning patient. So you have to take also the, the, the length of the face into consideration because with the short face, She's more likely to look, to look better after increasing VOD rather than this patient, right? What else? It, when you increase VOD, there is also posterior rotation of the mandible and posterior rotation of the chin. So if your chin looks like with Quentin Tarantino, maybe you're going to look better. If you've got a straight profile, maybe you will not look worse. But if you have this type of profile, you are very likely to look worse. And you know, we, the men, we got some other solutions to fix this problem and women do not have it. But we also have to remember is that when, you, 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 when your chin is retreated, very often it's not only the chin and the face, it's your bite. So we got increased over jet. And once you got increased over jet, like you see in here, once you increase VOD, where is the lower central going to? even more to the back. And what are you going to do now? So what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to make this palatal side that thick or maybe you're going to do the lower incisor that long or maybe you just meet something somewhere in the middle like this or maybe you decide let's leave the open bite. No matter what you're going to choose, is compromised treatment. This is why these patients very often they, they end up with orthognotic surgery. And this is why this is so tough with these people. Another thing, S sound, 66. When your patient is saying, shik, 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 it's very likely that he's got a big overjet. So he, he must go with big, with big distance to, 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 to get to the, to the smallest speaking position because the S sound is the smallest speaking position. Otherwise, if they are uh, saying 66, it means that they, they have not enough space between the teeth. So I, I, I remember that I did it a couple of times for my patient a couple of years ago. So after all the treatment, they had a problem with S sound and I was doing bidocalibration, was making the incisal edges shorter and it was one year, second year, third year and after four years, I realized what I have to do because 
what you have to do is just give me a second oh before I go to this let's have a look at the MRI how beautiful is how beautiful it is how it all must be coordinated the lips the teeth and a soft palate the tongue it all must be coordinated significantly but coming back to the space between the incisors there are studies which says that it should be about 0.2 millimeter what is 0.2 millimeter? 0.2 millimeter is 200 microns paper so when I finally realized what I have to do for my patient when I took this paper and I placed it between the frontal teeth and I told this patient to say S yes, and suddenly he was banging on the upper palatal side of the incisors and I was, I, I was taking the burr and grinding this marks and this is you know this is a very embarrassing moment because then your patient starts saying S yes, like this, like a magic but now he's asking you what the hell have you been doing for the last three years doctor and you know what you have to say then and this is the latest discovery of American dentists, of American researchers. And you should be very glad that I came across the ocean to find this knowledge for you, man. And then the patient is like, ooh, good. Always remember, American scientists, American scientists. So use a 200 microns paper and this paper is the same as the paper that we use for chewing. Not for guiding, for chewing rest position another thing that we are concerning very much uh, John Coy said just because something is reproducible doesn't mean it is not alterable and it is so true because for years we thought that we cannot alter the rest position because once we do that the patient will be banging on a tea while speaking but when you look at this study it is the people who are wearing full dentures full dentures for seven years wearing it down so what happened not only the not only the rest phase has changed the length but also the morphologic phase length has changed but have a look the rest the freeway space was following these changes it was always the same for these people so if you are going down with VOD it will follow the VOD if you're going up with VOD it will follow the VOD of course with some limits if you have problem to close your lips it, it is not good right so the, the rest position is reproducible what they say is the muscle tonus adapts to extreme changes in vertical dimension what they say is the jaw muscle motor behavior is more dynamic and adaptable to environmental changes than has ever been believed that has ever been believed and when you look at this study this is a very nice study this is the systematic review and what they talk about is that even if you uh, go if you increase VOD beyond the freeway space, patient will adapt. And we are not speaking about some constant location, but a comfort zone. What also we say that increasing VOD up to 5 mm is predictable and safe procedure. Of course, if you do it wrong, even 1 mm will be wrong. So what it also says that there are some associated signs and symptoms where they were self-limiting within two weeks so why is it like for majority of people if you increase VOD they will feel better some people they will feel worse but after two weeks they will adapt but some people they will feel all the time much worse this is because I don't know if you know that if we are increasing VOD is not only the jaw that is posterior rotating but there is also the posterior rotation of the skull so it, it works like a scissors and it is even 0.3 up to 9 degrees within the first hour what they say but in study which where it comes from it is uh, dolly and it's uh, they, they increase about 8 millimeters this is significant 8 millimeters and I think this is pretty subjective because what they check is the natural head posture what is natural head posture this is subjective how can you compare it between patient and even between one patient with within one minute it may be different because you may stand like this naturally you may stand like this naturally so of course it is important and but it's hard to measure this is what I'm saying because when you look this is my case when you look at this 
when we increase VOD for this patient and what you see is that the space in here is decreasing but if the space is big it's not a problem when the space is small and this patient already has a pain with, uh, with pain referred to the face you may make it even worse so this is why when we especially and when you have a patient with orofacial pain and you have a patient that looks like this and you do you want to increase VOD make it cephalometric picture with the natural head posture and then what we check is craniovertebral angle and the spaces functional spaces between the cervical vertebrae because once you decrease these spaces uh, there is irritation of trigeminal cervical nucleus and it may give you the irritation on the on the face which is of course uh, you will say that this is idiopathic you know what is idiot pathetic idiopathic so uh, we may consider many things to be idiopathic and this is important to take the cephalometric picture because sometimes you may have something that's called static atlas syndrome this is why you take the picture of flexion and extension this is very important for our physiotherapists to work on that because if that happens we have to do the anterior rotation of the head we have to increase the functional spaces between cervical vertebrae with some orthotherapy and so on what else is, we are concerned about is hyoid bone why hyoid bone is so important for us dentists because it's attached to the muscles from the bottom and from the top so when the patient has a four where the head posture, the scapula that is connected to the hyoid bone is pulling it down. So what do the muscles connected from the top are doing? It's lifting it up because it must be balanced. So muscles are in war. So what did the patient starts doing? He starts clenching, of course, idiopathic clenching. This is why hyoid bone is pretty important for us and also for the physiotherapy. This is why I cooperate also with the physiotherapies. Uh, and we are very concerned about the, the hyoid bone and this is also why I cooperate with the physiotherapist because you know the central collation is, uh, is a very controversial subject and you can imagine that tricentric relation is triple controversial so we are not concerned not only about the teeth not only about the TMJ not only about the cervical vertebrae but we take it all into consideration and you know in many cases it was and the people in the past were saying that the dental physiotherapy is a bullshit and this is like the you know working with energy or crystals and this is really hard to measure but now we got a lot of studies that confirm that actually without dental physiotherapy there is no treatment in many cases and when it comes to the big money like in here with the Sissoko transfer it was a Sissoko transfer from Aston Villa to Milan in 2009 it was a transfer that cost 12 million pounds and the doctor stopped it because they realized that his malocclusion predisposes him for the hip defect so when it comes to the big money we really know what we should be looking at so in here what we see is uh, three marks on the deprogrammer three marks on the deprogrammer is not so good as one mark but to have a one mark we need to have something else and this something else is the lip technique so this is the technique that I designed because I wanted to have a homemade deprogrammer and uh, one point that's going to be also stabilizer for the bite registration. So what I use in here is a Primo splint material, light curable material that I put it in the mouth. Not every lamp will light cure it. And I do it also extra orally and also I use a special extra oral lamp in the lab to light cure it. <clears throat> be careful because it produces heat in the mouth. Then I can add the platform like with a Coise the programmer. You can use a Vaseline, you, know, you can use this red liquid that is with the set of Primo Splint material. I don't know what kind of material you get in your country. So you light cure it in the mouth. <clears throat> now, sometimes the retention is good, sometimes even too good if it goes under the undercuts. But if it's not good, I reline it with, a, I use a triad gel. Triad gel is light curable material, so I put it on the and the, the programmer then I place it in the mouth and then I put it inside and I light cure it all right then the retention is pretty good so you do not have to use any wires anymore and the patient still have possibility to take it out so what is the next step is the lip technique and 
what I do is I tr tr make the retention for this little pin that will be marking on the platform it will be stabilizing the lip fuck lip technique is the last man incisal pin last man is me so when you do this pin is going to be the stabilizer I'll see you in a second so you do the tap 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 and you do the tap 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 you see the one single point so now we're gonna drill it and you want this one this pin to hold to hide inside this hole you know, I don't want this pin to increase vertical occlusal dimension that was primarily determined by the height of the platform and this is a stabilizer now so you know the problem was that sometimes we are registering the Byton Coiser programmer and in the meantime the patient swallows and then everything changes though so this is why it's so important to stabilize it during bite registration and we can talk about leaf gauge and lucia jig and dose manipulation and all these stuff but we do not have time to talk about it today this is why the course last especially in my country for international students it lasts eight days now because there are a lot of subjects to talk to talk about. If you want to see this video one more time, as, 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 as many other videos, you can go to, into the group Master Level Full Mobile Education, uh, Full Mobile Education, and then you may find lots of educational posts and videos and tutorials. So coming to the end of Monday morning patient, we spend a lot of time to shape the soft tissues in here, and you see how it ends. Uh, and how it ended, ended up with this papilla at the beginning and at the end. So it was the, it was the moment when we realized that we can do the prosthetics uh, now. And what I also wanted to check was the position in the condyle. So I did the MRI. What you see here, the white spots are the spaces between the disc and the fossa. It means there is not 100% stability. I wanted to stick this disc to the fossa. So when you look in here, it looks much better. So the position is a little bit different. The, disc, the condyle went back and uh, to the top, right? The, the left joint the same. You see this space in here, you see the space in here, so the condyle went up. This is why when you do the, the programmation, sometimes you get the premature contacts at the back because the teeth are getting closer. So this is how it was at the beginning and this is how it was at the end. And the final cephalometric picture showed me that I made a mistake because we didn't capture it at the, the proper time when he was in the, the program or on the temporary crowns because he has kyphosis. He, he, he lost already his lordosis and you know I can all still say that when he's grinding and clenching it may be idiopathic because we still do not know so much about bruxism but since we know that there is so many connections between the teeth and the muscles and the spinal uh, the spinal cord then you may realize that it may be not be idiopathic so i should be doing treatment on the spinal cord during the temporary stage so it's restoring cervical lordosis so this is what also physiotherapist is doing and this is the final result that we got i think pretty pretty nice and that was the evolution of the of the papilla from the beginning to the middle stage to the final stage and the arches were pretty wide and I'm always happy about wide arches because it means that there is enough space for the for the tongue and it was at the beginning and the meantime and the final and the final result so equilibration at the end if you do everything properly you do not do a lot of equilibration you do the night guard for your patient and then you got the happy patient that can finally can, can smile without any embarrassment you got a happy doctor happy dental technician and a happy patient and uh, then my, my final sentence is if you fail to plan you're planning to fail and it was Benjamin Franklin many many years ago so just to summarize what we've just learned is if you increase vertical occlusal dimension you must know why are you doing it
you must have a healthy TMJ and muscles. You have to analyze the face, you have to analyze the bite, you have to check phonetics and especially if you have the patient with oral facial pain with bad posture, I would rather do the cephalometric picture to check. Maybe he needs a physiotherapy prior the treatment because if you do not do all these things from the checklist, probably everything will be pretty nice because the patient will adapt and adaptation always has a cost so you must remember that and maybe your patient will feel very bad for one month and you'll say okay it will be better it will be and maybe one day it will be better but at what cost we do not want this adaptation to happen so just to summarize when we start our treatment, we start with a questionnaire. This is COIS questionnaire. We start with the stop bang questionnaire to know if your patient is likely to have a sleep apnea. And then we do the examination. This is my physio chart, also my communication with my physiotherapist. Because you may have like this very simple diagnosis from the COIS questionnaire, but you may also check the abduction truck the range of motion, if there is deviation, deflection, you check the rotation of C2, C1. This is what we do on the workshops also with dentists and physiotherapists. Uh, head, the, the posture analysis. I do not do it as precise as physiotherapists. This is their job. But when I see the patient looking like this, and he already had 20 different splints, and none of them worked, you know that maybe it's not only about the teeth. We, the dentists, we know many things about the teeth. So we look at the orofacial pain uh, just by thinking about a teeth, but it very often is, is some other reasons, maybe referral pain. So what we also check is the cephalometric, we check panoramic x-ray. Sometimes if we need, we do the, the MRI. And I, I, I check things to check if the patient need more uh, diagnostics. Because if I check malampathy, I tell my patient to say, ah, and I check, well, where is uvula? If I do the stop bank questionnaire, and it is positive, then I know that this patient is highly risk to have a sleep apnea, then I refer my patient to ENT doctor. This is not the job for me anymore. This is for my patient. So why I'm doing it is because I want to select the easy patient from the difficult patient. So once you do that, your life becomes easier. I also check the muscles, but only the important muscles. I do not check intraorally lateral pterygoid muscle because it's pointless. It's always almost painful. So what I check is muscle is temporalis, suboccipital muscles, trapezius, sternocleidomastoid muscles, and suprahyoid muscles. I also check the rockabata map of pain, which is pretty precise examination of joint. This is what we also do on the workshops, because you have to feel it, you have to touch it. In dentistry, lecturing is very often not enough. You have to do the hands-on. And when you're asking me why are we checking these muscles, you're asking why are we checking trapezius? Well, I'm a dentist, I'm not a physiotherapist. Why do I check that? Ladies and gentlemen, the first muscle that responds to increasing vertical occlusal dimension is trapezius because of posterior rotation on the head. So if your patient has a myofacial pain in trapezius and he looks like this when you increase the bite and then he, the patient is riding the bike, oh my god, think about it. This is why we need physiotherapists. Sternocleidomastoid muscles position your head this position and it has influence on the bite as well. So in this where we finally came up with a final diagnosis and this is where we know if the patient is easy and I can treat it in one week or maybe I need a full deprogrammation or maybe I need a uh, splint, maybe I need a physiotherapy or maybe this is not just not the patient for me. This is very valuable knowledge to know this is not the patient for me. I must refer this patient to somebody with bigger knowledge.